I'm here today to talk about using Rhino 6 for 3D printing. So just a quick background about me. Um, my name is Sophia Bellinger. Um, I'm the 3D model coordinator at Formlabs. So I design 3D parts for sample parts, um, trade shows, custom displays, studio shoots, marketing parts, um, both designing and then test printing a lot of that stuff. Um, my education background is actually in architecture and design. So that's how I got started with um, Rhino. So this is just a quick little collection of some of the parts that I've designed using Rhino and then printed in a bunch of different materials that Formlabs has to offer. So um, I'm going to start with the basics. Um, what is Rhino? or rhinoceros. Um, Rhino is a surface modeling CAD program. So it's what's called a freeform NURBS surface modeler, um, which basically is just a way of defining geometry. So you guys might have heard of T-splines before. It's super similar. Um, I tried to kind of give a little um, demonstration of the difference. So these splines um, tend to like traverse the whole surface. Like if you look at this green surface, there's lines all the way across and T-splines have these T-connectors. It's kind of a very um, basic definition or explanation of the difference between the two. But in Rhino, you can draw in 2D um, curves, uh, lines, everything, and then you can create surfaces, both 2D and 3D, and then define them all the way up to solids, which is what we end up printing. Um, I just wanted to also give a quick overview of the difference between parametric modeling and what Rhino does, which is freeform modeling. So you guys might have heard of parametric modeling before. Um, some programs that use it are SOLIDWORKS, Autodesk Fusion, um, uh, Onshape as well. Um, but basically, the way that those programs work is that you define um, certain constraints that relate parts of your model to the other parts. So for example, I made a very quick um, kind of sketch to try to illustrate my point, but um, the two edges of this um, surface are defined as perpendicular. You can apply that constraint. And then if you move this lower point um, down and to the right, um, those edges would stay perpendicular. Whereas if you do this in freeform modeling, basically the parts aren't defined um, by their relationship to the rest of the geometry or to whatever geometry you want to constrain it to. If you move that point, you're kind of stretching that surface. Very basic uh, overview of the difference. I know um, Cassie, who did a stream before, kind of went into more in detail, like what the different programs do. Um, so that's definitely something to check out here on Twitch or it, once that stream becomes unavailable. I believe it will be up on the Formlabs YouTube channel. Um, so basically, Rhino is a freeform modeler, um, but there are ways you can create this parametric capability. And um, the way to do that is by using another plugin called Grasshopper. So this is usually or often referred to as visual programming. Um, if you look in this picture, <laughs> you can see there are a bunch of different components and you connect them to each other. Um, and it's basically a way to like visualize your programming and connecting different components to each other to get different results. Um, there are a lot of possibilities of what you can do using Grasshopper, um, mostly because Grasshopper is the plugin to Rhino, but there are, I don't know, probably hundreds of plugins that you install for Grasshopper. So. A little confusing, but there's basically a lot that you can do. Um, you can also custom code your own components um, using C Sharp or Rhino scripting, and then you can also do it in Python. 
So if you're good at programming or into coding, that's something else to learn. Um, this is just an overview of some of the plugins um, that are cool. I'm not going to go through these ones today, but um, I thought they were kind of interesting to hear about. But there's one called Kangaroo, which um, is a physics simulator. So in this picture, you can see you might be applying gravity to this net to create the surface um, that hangs based on physics, basically. Um, Ladybug, which is a climate simulator, it's a little more architectural focused um, and kind of analyzing buildings and that type of stuff. Um, and then Peacock, which is a jewelry modeler. So it has built in components that you can plug in and kind of plug and play when you're learning how to design jewelry. Um, they are all animal themed, but this is just some of the capabilities that um, Grasshopper can unlock when you're using Rhino. Um, I'm going to go into three different examples of what I did to use Grasshopper to um, create parts for 3D printing specifically. So the first thing I'm going to do is just show you guys the overall interface because it can be a little bit confusing if you've never seen it before. So hopefully this works. Um, Right now, theoretically, we should all be seeing the Rhino um, interface. As soon as you open up Rhino, there are four different viewports. Um, so um, it's all your different like top view, perspective, front, right. Um, it's basically just a big world axis. Um, I like to work this way because you can have a bunch of different iterations all next to each other. Um, and kind of see everything that you're working on all in this large canvas. Um, and I really like that way of working. Um, and then on this left side, you have all of your different um, commands or like things that you wanna do. So one of them, for example, if you hover over, it will say polyline. The other thing that Rhino has is a command line. So you can also type it in. Um, so if you wanted to make a polyline, you type in polyline, hit enter. And then once you hover your mouse over the viewport, you can see what you're doing. So I'm just going to start by clicking. And in all the four viewports, you can kind of see that there's a polyline forming. I don't know what I'm making, but uh, that's basically how it works. And when you're done, you press enter, and then you have your geometry. So this is 2D. It's a curve. Um, there's also some preset like boxes, um, spheres, I don't know, very basic shapes. Uh, and if you change the way that these are shaded, you can also see them in different ways. So lots of different ways to view it. Shaded view, rendered view. Um, I tend to work in ghosted because you can still see the 3D shape. Um, but um, you can see through to the other edges as well. Um, so this is just the basic Rhino interface. Um, the way to access the plugin Grasshopper is you type in Grasshopper at the top and hit enter. And then you wait for it to load. So this is the kind of Rhino to Grasshopper um, interface. Grasshopper is a little bit similar in that you have your components and you have your large um, canvas. So basically what you have here are your different um, components that you connect to each other to um, perform certain actions or like computations. So this one that I just dragged down is called curve. Um, so what you can do with Rhino and Grasshopper is you can either make your own geometry that lives in Grasshopper, or you can reference parts that already exist in Rhino. So for example, I already drew this curve. I can go into Grasshopper and click set one curve. It'll tell me to reference a curve in Rhino. I click on it and then it will turn 
um, from orange to gray. And then when you click on it, you can see that you have that curve defined. So this is just super basic overview of what it's going to look like. Um, but the other thing, let's see, just a quick demonstration of what you do to kind of connect components in Grasshopper is you have this little um, end cap thing and you drag it and uh, into another component. So this component is um, divides your curve into different parts. So for example, if I connect curve here, it will show in green all the different division points. And it's already preset to a certain number of times that it's going to divide. So I should have 10 different segments here. Um, so the important thing to note here is that whatever you do in Grasshopper only lives in Grasshopper. For example, my curve is still one curve in Rhino. It's not 10 segments until you do something which is called baking. And that's basically transferring your information from Grasshopper to Rhino. Um, so this means that whenever you're done working in Grasshopper, you can transfer it into Rhino and make sure, and once you've done that, you can't re-edit it in Grasshopper unless you re-reference it, um, if that makes sense. So there's a little bit of like um, messing around, like learning the different interfaces before um, you can really dive into all the different components that, and what's really possible, but um, there is a lot of different kind of things that you can do in this program. Um, and I'm going to show you three different examples. Um, let me just get back to the slideshow. Um, all right, so what we've gone through the interface. Um, the first example that I'm going to show is um, desk name tags. So one of the things that I did um, was make um, name tags for every person who starts at Form Labs um, in the um, Somerville office. So basically, um, instead of having to redo each name tag every time a new person started, um, I uh, made a program that would do that for me. So I've made about 400 name tags so far, and we print them in draft for a quick turnaround. So four hours um, to print six name tags directly on the platform. Um, so you could do it in one day, basically. Um, and I'm just gonna go through my file here. This is gonna be more of a demonstration of what is possible and less of a tutorial. This won't like go into depth of every single component, um, but I just wanted to show you guys exactly what's possible with this. So um, let me go back to that. Uh, here we go. So this is my file. Um, as you can see, I have this geometry in Rhino already. So this is what I'm going to reference in Grasshopper. It's the base of the name tag. Um, and this is my name tag file. Um, it looks a little complicated, but I'm just going to go through the basics. Um, so I have this panel where I will type in names and I'm being very creative and using my siblings names. And then I also added a Ben because it's a three letter name and I wanted to show different lengths of names. Um, so moving on, I added an extra line accidentally. <laughs> um, and then basically what this program does is takes the um, strings, like the actual um, letters of the names, uh, and it makes them into curves, which I then define as a surface, which you can see here in Rhino. And again, everything that I'm doing in Grasshopper lives in Grasshopper until I tell it to live in Rhino, basically. It's the best way I can explain that. So um, I'm orienting the surface, extruding it, and then grouping it together with the actual name tag. And then I have a little slider where I can scale the name. And I basically, the way that I did this was through a little custom C-sharp component. It has like three lines of code in it, but 
basically, if the name is too big, I can scale it down. Um, so that's what that is, three lines of code, scale down if it's too big. And then once you go back to um, this part, you can adjust the name as you see fit. Uh, the name index is actually how you can scrub through all the different names. So it starts with index zero, my name, and then you can scrub through and see all the different names and adjust them accordingly um, with the scale of the name if they're too big. So this next section is just what's the, the baking part of transferring the information from Grasshopper into Rhino. So um, for each index, I would go through and basically activate that component, scale my name to what I want it to be, and then, um, yep, just transfer that information. And that's essentially the workflow of that. Um, from there, I would go into Rhino and then combine the name tags um, and then mesh it, export it as normal, um, wherever that would need to go and then bring it into preform. Um, so yeah, that's basically that. I think I got a question. Um, the question, I have students that will be learning CAD basics. I'm probably going to encourage them to use Fusion 360. Is that a reason, is there a reason you would recommend Rhino over Fusion 360? Um, I think the programs are different. I Sometimes it depends on what it's for. I've taught students Rhino before. Um, it basically, it's just, I feel like it's easier to learn to start with, especially because you can draw a lot and you can mess around and it's really easy just to like click on a component and then you see the feedback immediately. Um, from what I remember with Fusion, it can be a little bit hard to learn the sketching component and then learning the um, like extruding and all the different stuff. Um, I will say if you're doing more complicated things and you want to make sure that it um, is like a closed solid and you're doing it for 3D printing, um, Fusion is a great thing to learn. You can also use Tinkercad just to learn those basic um, commands. I think Liz did a stream of like some of the basics of how she used it for jewelry last week. So that's one one thing that you could do as well. But um, I would say a lot of it's just what you're comfortable in. If it's if it's easier to explain in Fusion, then I mean, I would say students are pretty like open to learning anything. And um, yeah, it just really depends. I just find Rhino super easy as like an opening like interface to just look at and like be able to see, OK, I can sketch and I can make shapes and that's how that works. So. Yeah, hopefully that was somewhat helpful. <laughs> All right, um, the next example I'm going to go through is uh, lattices. So lattices are super fun structures that you can make. Um, it's basically one little cell that's repeated over and over again. Um, the reason that I made lattices was originally for the launch of elastic resin, which when you um, print lattices and elastic, you can like squish it and it's very fun. And it's kind of the, just this abstract um, way of like demonstrating the material properties. So I'm going to show you guys a quick demo of this. I think I'm going to have to speed this one up because I took too long um, when I was making this recording. Um, all right, so similar thing here, I'm opening up Rhino and then I'm opening up Grasshopper. So I'm, I have my interface with Rhino, I type in Grasshopper, and then I'm going to go to the intralattice component, which is at the top. And with intralattice, uh, there, as you can see at the top here, there's not a lot of components. So it's actually very easy and intuitive to learn. Um, so what I do is I use all of their preset cells. So when you drag this component down, you can see in Rhino in a second <laughs> how um, whenever you click those arrows, those are the different base components, the different cells. Um, and then you would connect them to 
uh, kind of copy them to make this larger lattice. So this is actually predefined. So when you connect topography up here to topography, there's already predefined numbers and then you can actually see the whole like lattice structure. Um, so this is not 3D yet, which is why you have to connect it to this next um, meshing component where you connect the struts to the struts and then you define the radius. So as soon as you define the radius, um, you can see it in Rhino and it's only red because that's the way that it's displayed. I think you might be able to change that display color. Um, it's not angry at you or anything. Um, for this one, I decided to bump down the radius um, just so I could see each of the individual struts a little bit better. Um, and then another thing that I like to do when I'm working with meshes in Grasshopper is use another component. It's called Weaverbird. It's actually another uh, plugin. <laughs> There's a lot of plugins that will help you like basically refine your work. Um, this is not a necessary step, but basically it will make your mesh smoother and look a little bit nicer. Um, and the reason for doing that is just that the quality and resolution on the form two and form three means that uh, when you're printing and the meshes are lower poly, it means that you can actually see the different faces. So um, I like to smooth it out using this extra step. It is a little bit computation heavy, which is why sometimes my computer um, takes a little bit longer to do this. Um, but I'm just working on a laptop. If you have a desktop and a more powerful computer, it shouldn't take this long. But as you can see, I'm waiting. <laughs> um, once you go back into Rhino and you bake that again, which is just reference or dumping the part from Grasshopper into Rhino, um, you can see that you have your lattice. And basically from here, you can export that and bring it into Preform or whatever program and then print it. Um, the next thing that I'm going to go over quickly is just gradient lattices. So gradient lattices are cool. It's very, very similar, the workflow, basically the same, except you connect it to a different component and you have like one more step. But it's fun with like materials such as elastic when you're printing because you can um, compress the material differently depending on the thickness of the struts at different points. So here I decided to change the shape. So I went back to that original um, cell and just changed the cell. I also made it smaller. Basically for that, I'm just connecting a smaller number to these number of cells in all the different directions. Um, and that'll just, yeah, make it smaller. And then instead of choosing this homogeneous gradient, I choose the uh, heterogen gradient component and then um, Grasshopper has a preset gradient that you can just literally plug in. So already in, in Rhino, you can see how it's thicker on one side and thinner on the other. So um, I think here I decided to change the radius, to make it a little more obvious. Then it looked a little bulky, so I think I brought it back down. <laughs> um, but basically, you can see um, the difference there between the one side and the other. Uh, the thing about the preset gradients is you can change the gradient as well. So if you make it um, cylindrical around the z-axis, it's thinner in the center um, and thicker around the edges. So you can play around with that. I'm doing the same thing here where I'm bringing the mesh into the weaver bird to make it smoother. So you can just see immediately how it like smooths out some of those um, facets in the mesh. And again, going back into Rhino, baking it, and then you can see it in Rhino and basically export that and print it as well. And then you have a fun abstract material cube. Um, all right, moving on to the next one. Um, this is how I made a more organic looking model. So it's basically, using um, a tool to wrap meshes around other geometry. Um, 
So it sounds confusing and it is a little confusing, um, but um, it was basically a way for me to, I want to say automate or like have Grasshopper create these like rain looking <laughs> folds for me instead of having to do all that modeling by hand. Um, so let me get into this one. Again, this will be more of a demo because this, this program is called, I forgot to mention, it's called Cocoon. Um, and it does take a little bit of playing around with the numbers. There are not a lot of components, but some of it is, is just like um, kind of optimizing the numbers to make sure you get the results that you want. So here in Rhino, you can see I have my surface. I'm in render view, so that's why it might look a little bit different. Um, with the surface, I have it referenced already in Grasshopper. Um, you can see this is the Cocoon um, plugin that I'm using for this. And the way that it works is you define certain things or geometries as charges. So what I'm doing here is I have these curves that I drew on the surface of the brain. Um, which are meant to like simulate the real anatomy of the brain. Again, this is a demo of like a looks like brain. It's not a scan or, or a true anatomical model. You would definitely need a real brain scan for that. But I'm tr I was trying to get as close as I could to what would look like a brain. <laughs> um, and then you basically define those as charges and give them a strength. And then once you have kind of defined your surface, defined your curves, um, you merge them together and you bring them into this cocoon component. And this is the part where you kind of have to mess around with the numbers in order to get them um, to look the way that you want them to. So once you change those numbers around, it can like take a lot longer to um, actually create the geometry depending on your cell sizes and all that. But basically it's like, taking that curve and wrapping um, geometry around it. And as you can see now in Rhino, basically you're getting this bumpy structure. It's hard to see right now, but once you refine that mesh and again, <laughs> transfer it back into Rhino, you can see how it kind of creates that cool <laughs> organic looking um, folds, which again is just a way of having a program compute it for you instead of um, like having to do all of this by hand. And there are definitely ways to do this, but I would, I'm sure it's a lot easier when you're mesh sculpting or mesh modeling rather than um, working with uh, surfaces like you do in Rhino. Um, and then this is, the rest of this is just doing the bottom part of the brain. <laughs> so um, very similar process. Um, it was just a different file. So once you go into this file, I have that surface at the bottom that I pre-made in Rhino, um, defined and referenced in Grasshopper. Um, again, I have the lines. And then um, the only change with this one is that I also added um, points. So what you can do is like, populate a geometry with points. So this just creates a scattering of points along a surface that you have defined. Um, and then what this does when you're actually making the, um, what's it called, the actual surface and you're doing the charges is that it makes it look a little bit more bumpy. So um, once I bring that in, you can see how it's not just um, like rigid lines, there's more like I don't know, a bumpiness to it because of those points that were added. So for this one, I smoothed it even further using that component that I mentioned previously, which is Weaver Bird, um, the subdivision. And then once you bring it into Rhino, you have your geometry. And that's um, how I made that um, part that I then subtracted from this um, other model, which is of a human, it's half of a human um, head. 
which I actually made in Blender using its mesh subdivision modeling, which is an entirely different topic. And it's very different from um, surface modeling and then going from surfaces to meshes. Um, but yeah, hopefully um, those examples showed you what Grasshopper and Rhino can really um, bring to the table as far as like elevating your CAD game. Um, <laughs> So now I'm going to go into um, this interactive engineering display. So um, a quick background um, about, I don't even know how many months ago now, two, three, <laughs> two, three months ago, um, someone on the design team approached me to create a custom display for AMUG 2020, which would show off the new additions to our engineering library at the time, which were Tough 1500, and at that time, Tough 2000 was launching. So um, we kind of brainstormed having this like handle and lever display, um, and what it ended up turning into was um, a larger sort of interactive display where we wanted to show off all of our engineering resins, not just the Tough and Durable family. So. Um, basically how I start design or designing for this is, um, identifying all of my resins. Um, here, there are the eight engineering, um, focused resins. Um, so starting with Tough 1500, um, I basically think of a material property that applies to each resin or like what it's pretty much best at. And then... Um, from there, kind of decide what the actual part will be. So for Tough 1500, um, it's a quick return material. When you manipulate it, it'll snap back into its original shape without deforming pretty quickly. Tough 2000 is generally sturdy and very resistant to wear and tear. Um, durable is great for moving parts, um, parts that are interfacing with each other because it has a super smooth um, surface. Uh, high temp is good for heat resistant uh, applications. Elastic is good for soft and stretchy materials. Um, rigid is good for parts with um, no give or deformation when you apply certain pressures to it. Um, Gray Pro is just a general overall like good for fine detail and sturdy um, material. And flexible is good for soft touch um, materials. Uh, and applications. So from here, the kind of parts that I decided on was for TUF 1500, I would make little snap connectors to hold parts in place because you put them under pressure for a brief period of time and then they kind of return to their shape and have to stay there. Um, TUF 2000, I decided to make a handle because it's um, taking a lot of interaction slash um, I don't know, wear and tear over time when you're using that one component. Durable, um, I like to make gears and linkages in durable because of that surface finish, it slides um, pretty easily across each other. Um, high temp, again, heat resistant enclosures, it's a really good application for that. Um, elastic, I decided to make a tire because it will be easy to manipulate over a wheel hub. Um, for rigid, I decided to make a fan blade because you don't want that to warp over time. Um, wheel, uh, Gray Pro, I made the actual wheel hub because I wanted to be able to show um, some of the details while still having it be super sturdy. Um, and flexible, I made the grip part of the handle. Um, and yeah, let's move on to the CAD part of this. So, um, the CAD of this wasn't necessarily super complicated. There are just a number of parts that have to connect to each other. So um, the main thing is just like testing um, tolerances between different materials. Um, I definitely don't have a specific number to give. Um, I think Cassie also mentioned this in her stream, but there's like kind of a range depending on what material is going with what material. And that's simply just because the materials have different properties and um, they just interface differently and print a little bit differently. So for example, 
some materials might have a 0.4 millimeter space tolerance that you have to leave and some might be smaller and some might be larger. It just honestly does sometimes take a little test print um, to do that. So I'm going to show you guys very quickly how I make um, gears in Rhino. Um, this will be pretty um, simple. It is just sketching and then extruding, but I think it's worth showing just how simple that workflow can be and how you can make functional parts um, with that in Rhino. So, all right. so again, this is the Rhino work plane. Um, you have your four viewports and I'm starting with the top view. Um, and the way that I like to work is basically by starting with sketching. So I'm making my 2D um, sketches. Um, so I'm starting with a circle for this gear. And basically right now I'm thinking about what um, size that I want it to be. So. For this one, I'm going with 120 millimeters or 12 centimeters um, as kind of the outer diameter of the gear. And then from there, I want to make a little hole in the center. So I'm just literally drawing that. Um, and I think I made this one 15 millimeters in diameter. Um, and the, oh, before I forget, when I'm sketching, you can see that there's like these little snaps that come up. It's called object snaps. And that just means that like you're making sure that when you're drawing, you're snapping to the center of whatever else, whatever other geometry you have. So um, you'll definitely see that. I can point that out on the next thing that I draw. Um, so as you can see, it like clips to the center there. And I'm making sure that this is at 90 degrees or a straight line up, I guess. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just draw a gear tooth. Um, I'm just going to draw one because um, I'm going to use a cool command to kind of copy it all the way around. Um, but first, I just want to make sure that my like reference lines make sense. Um, let's see. I'm going to start with the top of the gear tooth. Um, gear teeth kind of have this shape of like it's straight at the top it curves out and then it comes in at the bottom a little bit so i'm basically trying to recreate that um another thing i'll say is that there are ways to like i'm sure like mathematically make this more accurate um you can also use um gear generators to make 2d gears and then if you need to trace that you can do that as well um and so once i've basically drawn the outline half of the outline of the gear I will mirror it to make sure that it's perfectly symmetrical. And here, um, I basically decided I wanted to manipulate it a little bit more. So what I do in, in Rhino 6, when you click on your geometry, it turns on the points of that. So you can actually drag those around and edit your geometry um, once you've already drawn it. So you're not like super set in stone once you've drawn your sketch. You can like change it as you're going and manipulate it. Now I'm going to mirror it again. I think I've decided that that's good enough. And then I'm just going to join the parts together, which just basically means that I'm those four segments are all going to be one part. And then um, the command I'm using is called array polar. And you're basically just copying this one uh, part like all the way around the edges of your circle. So I'm guessing on the number that I'm going to need. I think I said 70 gear teeth, um, far too many, because there's no room um, for another gear to actually fit. Um, so I'm just literally clicking on that number up there where it says um, items. If you click on that, you can change it. You don't have to start fully over with the command. You can just edit as you're going. Um, so here, I think the number I'm going with is 40. Or, um, and then once you're done, you press enter and you have your, your teeth all the way around. And what I'm doing now is just, I'm, I wanted to check if there was enough room um, for another gear to be next to it with the same um, geometry. For this one, I 
decided it was a little too close, um, especially with tolerances for printing. And um, I think I decided just to go back and um, bring the number of gear teeth back down to 43. So it's super quick. I just go in, I type in 43 instead of 42 or 44 and then press enter. And then you have the teeth. Um, again, I'm just checking um, that it will fit. To me, that looks good. Uh, and then I'm moving on. So the next part is kind of um, another thing that I like to do with 3D printing is uh, find ways to save material. So um, for this, I'm definitely I'm adding like a little border and then I'm going to add some curved um, struts, I guess, to kind of not just have it be a large block of resin, but have some structure and also that way it will look cool when it's turning. <laughs> so I'm making these curves. Um, I basically just, once I did made the curve, I offset it from the other part. Um, and I know it looks really crazy right now, but I'm gonna show you a way to bring it together. Like obviously these parts are overlapping and it's looking a little crazy and these parts are overlapping and you're probably like, this looks terrible. How is this ever going to come together? but there's a very easy way to do it. Um, so there I just used a ray polar. It's the same as before, the same command um, as the gear teeth. And then once I've done that, I like to copy everything over. There's a shortcut for it. If you drag um, and hold down alt, you're basically copying. So now I'm gonna use what's called curve Boolean. It's a command. Um, I'm clicking on the outside um, and then once you click on the outside, it selects everything on the inside of the curves that you have selected. Um, and then I'm subtracting the parts that I don't want. So I don't want these parts to be in my model. It's outlining in black the parts that you'll see. Um, and so then when you click enter, you have the actual outlines and you don't have to do any like super crazy like trimming um, in 2D. You don't have to like make sure that everything's super aligned because it's very like, I don't know, time intensive. It's just a quick shortcut to just get the outlines of what you want. Um, and so now I'm just making another little gear to fit next to it. Um, same process, two circles, concentric. Um, I'm going to copy this gear tooth that I already made, um, accidentally copy an extra one, and then array that around that circle so i think i'm going to change the number there as well i think i went back down to nine even though i had already tried that um and i think 11 is the number that i'm going to end up going with yep and then same process um oh first just double check that it will fit and i think i'm okay with that so um curve boolean Click on the outside to select everything on the interior and then you're subtracting the parts you don't want. And then you're left with two gears. And then here's a part <laughs> where you need to make it 3D. So the command that I use, again, I'm calling them commands because I'm typing them. That's how I work is by typing. I don't find the icon, but you choose your distance that you want to extrude it very similar to other programs. Um, and then you're left with your 3D parts. Um, again, these are more basic extrusions. You can add more features. Um, so something that I have done before is add like an additional feature to the top of a gear, like a little um, edge just to give it some dimension when you're looking at it. Um, definitely for this display, I kept a lot of the geometry pretty, pretty simple just because I wanted it to function well. Um, and then another thing that you can do when you're working um, with parts like this is um, chamfer edges if you want. And I like to, when I know that I'm going to print something directly on the build platform, which I do a lot, um, I like to add a chamfer on the bottom. So basically that just means you're, you're adding a little edge that goes in so that it's easier to remove from the build platform. Um, so if you use the command chamfer edge and then select all of the bottom 
edges, um, you basically just add that chamfer in. Um, and this is, again, something that other programs have very similar commands to do. Um, but it's just a little tip for when you're printing things directly on the platform is just adding a little chamfer. Um, and then you can see that in the render view a little bit better. You can also add fillets to edges once you've made your model. I would definitely recommend doing this once you're like done with your base geometry. If you fill at the edges, you get a softer like profile. It's not as sharp. Um, and yeah, it's just one way of adding more features. Once you have kind of your geometry, you can definitely edit it. You can move faces, you can move edges. Those are all commands you can do as well. Um, it just takes some playing around with to make sure that you don't distort your whole part. Um, but yeah, basic how I make gears <laughs> in Rhino. And then um, this will kind of get into um, this interactive display that I made. Um, but real quick, I think we had another question. Um, what are the practical uses for lattice structures? Okay, so going back to the lattice structures, can these be integrated into more complex designs? Uh, definitely. So one of the practical uses for lattice structures you might have seen is like in shoe soles. So like the New Balance Form Labs shoes, um, they had a somewhat more complicated lattice structure obviously and it was printed using rebound resin but basically what that meant is that um the lattice structure you're saving material and it's also creating a certain way of compressing i don't know the exact um i don't know technology behind that specific part but that's one example of like lattice structures being used in um an actual more complex design um i would also think of it in like other compressive um, applications. I can't think of something off the top of my head, but I'm sure parts that are being compressed in some way um, and you wanna have that lattice structure, maybe certain like not watertight gaskets, but like seals that you're putting, you might be able to make lattice um, structures to like save material. Um, yeah, it could be, could be cool applications. Um, all right, so continuing on, um, something else I like about Rhino is that you can use render view um, in Rhino and assign those materials and kind of map them into the real world with reference dimensions. So I'm gonna go into my Rhino file for this interactive display. And I'll also walk through um, what this display actually um, includes. So let's wait for it to load. Okay. Um, basically, I showed you guys how to make the gear. This is basically the exact gear that I made. Um, and then I just made different sizes of gears um, and made it connect to a fan. A lot of them have these square. Um, interfaces and that's simply because when you're rotating you don't want it to slide so if you're having a circle um like a circular hole and a circular peg for example if you're rotating that it'll just slide if you add a square um peg that means that when you rotate it it won't slide um the snap connectors are holding everything together in place um this outer one is high temp enclosure so I'm just going through what um, the different parts that I like brainstormed actually, of course, want to. So um, this is the handle, the flexible grip, more kind of stands and connectors, um, the elastic tire, um, the wheel hub in Gray Pro. This is another handle and then the linkage part. Um, and then what I like to do is this kind of, it looks a little mm, confusing, but I have a bunch of layers and these layers are corresponding to the resins that I want to print things in. So um, with this one, I have assigned um, a material color to each. Basically that means that like I can go in 
and then choose a specific color. And what I'm trying to do is like kind of match what it would look like in real life. Um, and then when you go to rendered view, you can see um, in real time just the preview of what this might look like if you were to print it. So everything that's like yellowy is durable. <laughs> the orange like is high temp, rigid, tough 2000, flexible, elastic, great pro. Um, and yeah, it's just one way of like seeing your parts in a more real realistic way, I guess. Um, and then the other thing that I like to do, this was originally meant for a trade show display. <laughs> so I like to map out the table space. So for example, this is the dimensions of that table. Um, I can make this a little bit more visible if I just make a little box. But basically, this would demonstrate like, oh, this is what the space will or what these parts will look like spaced out on a table. Um, it's really useful just to show with the people that you to show to the people that you're working with so they can be like, oh, cool. This is how this would look in real life. Um, and yeah, that's another reason I love Rhino. You can um, put real world dimensions and kind of see what your parts are going to look like using the render view. Um, all right, let's go back. Let's see. All right. Now we'll get into printing prep. This will be relatively quick, um, but basically it's just importing files into Preform and setting them up. And I'll just explain um, quickly some of the things to keep in mind, especially when you're printing gears. Um, all right, so here, when you open Preform, um, you have your like build plat or I'm uh, sorry, build volume defined, and this is for Form three. Um, so I have my two models, a durable medium gear and a durable small gear. So this is basically the, um, models that I showed how I made. Um, and for the small gear, you can see the, the chamfer at the bottom. And that's because I'm going to leave it the way it is. Um, and then one of the features, by the way, with Preform that I really like, it's relatively newer. Um, is array. So if you're printing a bunch of gears and they're actually the same, you can array your models um, and like just copy them all along the build platform. And you don't have to like um, copy them manually and move them around. <laughs> um, so that's just kind of one little feature um, if you're printing a bunch of gears and a bunch of parts um, that you can use. And you can obviously like do some more moving around by hand to make it a little more space efficient. Um, once I brought this in, um, normally I would actually print this on the platform, but for this project, I wanted to kind of optimize how many prints I was running. So I didn't want to print like 20 different files. I wanted to just print a few different or a lot fewer files and like get a lot more parts on each platform. So here I would kind of mess around with orientation, rotate it in different dimensions. Um, and then what I usually do is auto generate the supports to start with. Um, oh, and another thing to do, if you're not sure like what parts need to be supported, you can turn on the show minima just to see different areas and then rotate and it should update. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you're printing gears specifically, is that the parts that are um, interfacing with each other and sliding, um, you just want to make sure that there's not too many supports on those parts because it's harder to finish. Um, when you're taking them off, those parts do need to be perfectly smooth. So if you like orient it in the right way, you can lower the amount of supports that you have on those um, areas. Um, and then once you generate those supports, um, you basically have your file. And then I accidentally generated supports for the little one too. So I think I can get rid of those. But basically I also, you can duplicate um, that gear uh, to have more than like one or two on the platform. 
and then you would just basically go to print it. Um, and then I think I just wanted to show you guys really quick how many parts I packed on the platform um, for all of this. So this is like one of the files. And I actually, I have the parts here as they are in, the, in preform. But um, basically they're all um, supported on this one. I would say the bevel gear, I don't know if you can see this. I think you can see this. Um, the bevel gear here is the better oriented part because there are no supports really on the teeth, the part that are the part that's like rotating on the other gear. Whereas the larger gear, I would definitely find a way to reorient this because when you have to finish this part, um, there's a lot more work that goes into it versus the bevel gear. Um, all right. And then, oh. And in case you were wondering, this was 13 prints um, total and eight different resins, which is just all the different engineering resins. Um, so really briefly, I think I might be running a little bit lower on time, but um, finishing parts. Um, I use a combination of blush cutters, sandpaper. Um, I use tweezers to get some of the supports out of the more difficult to reach places. Um, uh, just an exacto blade um, to help get some of the flashing off the sides. Um, and then it just, yeah, requires patience when you're working with parts like this. Um, I do have a quick demonstration just of like a part in progress. So for example, there's still supports in here um, and also on this other part. Um, but I'm just testing like the way that this is working. So um, yeah. If you want to see the fan part, this is that printed in rigid. Um, when you're finishing different materials, you also have to be um, either more careful or less careful. Like durable, you could probably be a little rougher. Rigid, you have to be careful about breaking stuff. Um, oh, and then just uh, things I would do differently. Like this part, for example, I would not print with this many interior supports, but it was really hard to finish. And uh, yeah, I would just reprint that differently if I had the time. Um, all right, now we get into the final designed assemblies. So this first one was the gear train. So basically it's just demonstrating like one, two, four, five gears <laughs> um, moving together. And the interaction is that you turn a handle um, and the fan turns. So with these, a lot of them are like, oh yeah, you could definitely run this with a motor. But um, the point was kind of to show at a, in a trade show setting, obviously like you're actually like touching a part of it and it's reacting in a certain way to give you an output. So here is that final gear train. Um, so as you can see, you're turning the handle and yes, that's a cameo from my dog. <laughs> um, and it's rotating the fan. I am holding it down here because ideally this would be mounted. But yeah, it's all the gears turning nicely. The little feature um, is pretty cool when you're um, rotating it, the little struts on the gears, and it's kind of reminiscent of the actual fan itself. Um, moving on. The bevel gear and axle display um, basically just takes the rotation and transfers it to different axes. Um, and I thought that was a cool way of just showing like you're rotating in one axis and it's translating it a few different directions to then show you a wheel turning. So this is that one. And that's where this part comes in as well. <laughs> but the one in the video is the finished part. So this you're turning, the bevel gears are turning along this axle and then the wheel spins on the other end. And then the final one is the linkage. So for this one, I was missing the stand part, um, which I didn't end up having time to print, but in the future, there will be some content coming out where you can see the actual final assembled linkage. Um, so stay tuned for that. Not sure where it will be exactly, but it will be somewhere. Um, so for this one, 
I, what I really wanted to show here was when you're rotating, um, you're translating that rotation to linear motion. So this is a quick little demo of that. You're rotating and the actual point of this linkage is moving in a linear fashion. And yes, it is wobbling because I did not have the stand. <laughs> um, and yeah, those are my three um, interactive demos that I had originally designed for AMUG. Um, hopefully this was a cool way of seeing how you can use Rhino 6 and then seeing how all of our different engineering resins can create functional parts. Um, basically, now I just wanna go through a few more resources you guys can check out. So um, basically you can download Rhino 6 um, for a three month free trial. So that is kind of nice. You get to have the full functionality of the program. Um, so if you go to rhino3d.com and then go to the download tab, you can get a full three month trial of Rhino. Um, the one caveat is that Rhino 6, um, all of the plugins for Grasshopper, I believe they only work on Windows computers, but um, Grasshopper does work on a Mac. You just might not be able to download all of the different um, plugins that I was displaying. Um, earlier. So like intro lattice, I'm not sure if it'll work. It might, um, but I have not specifically tried it. Um, another thing that I wanted to just tell you guys about is you can get very in-depth <laughs> step-by-step tutorials and like a super um, basic, um, I don't know, overview of the program on lynda.com. They have one month free. Um, so you can kind of get a very step-by-step -step way. This was definitely more of a um, demo rather than specifically a tutorial on exactly how to use a program. Um, that's something that I'm also could do in the future if anyone's interested. Um, something else to check out is um, engineering from home. So we did put out a kind of blog and a guide on what to do when we're all here stuck at home um, and just how to keep up productivity and kind of engineering from home and using your 3D printer, um, keeping those resources active. Um, another thing to uh, check out, we're having some office hours later this week on Thursday if you're interested in the Form 3L. So if you go to the Form Labs sessions page through the main um, Form Labs site, you can get to that. Next week on Twitch, I believe it's the same time, um, Tuesday at noon. Yeah, I think Dan is um, posting in the comments. Um, it'll be a ZBrush, so that's mesh sculpting. So if you've always wanted to learn how to do that, um, I think that's going to be really cool. Um, and then if you um, end up missing any of the streams, um, they've expired on Twitch, uh, you can check out the YouTube channel for some highlights. So that's the Form Labs YouTube channel link right there. Um, and I think that's it. I'm going to wait a few more seconds if anyone wants to post any questions in the chat. Um, I answered a few as we were going, but let's see. Oh, there was a question about the next lesson next week, Tuesday noon, ZBrush. Um, and yeah, I think if no one else has any questions, um, thank you all for... <laughs> listening, tuning in. Um, hopefully see you all next week.